Okay, we have a little music that's always good to start the day off or the evening off with. We're going to talk about food again, chapter 18, um, the guides and steps to a healthier you, and that also helps you with your uh, patients. You guys know the food pyramid has was reworked a couple years back. Depending on where you look, you still have the pyramid. Uh, other times they show you a plate. And one of the things I show you with the plate is not three equal divisions, but more of more fruits and vegetables and some grains and less meat. It's interesting when you read some of the different articles that go with that, uh, who agrees with that and who doesn't agree with that. So this is just another food pyramid, and you can see we have grains, vegetables, fruits, oils, milk, meat, and beans, and the different perspective of how much you should have of each of those. This is the newer one that came out. Um, there's one of, from Harvard, and I think this is where this came from. But you can see the different servings. And what makes up the bottom of this food pyramid is your bread, cereals, rice, and pasta, um, and your healthy foods that you can with those. Oils and fats and everything are very sparingly used, but they still exist as far as that goes. So carbs, these are your most common abundant carbs, are your starches and sugars and fibers. Your sugar molecules will link together long branching chains. And remember with your ATP, you need the carbs, which turns in the glycogen to be able to produce it. And you're gonna end up with maybe 36 molecules. The basic building block is a sugar molecule, okay? And this is a union of your carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, um, and then your, Starches and fibers are chains of sugar molecules. Okay, starches are basically, for the most part, broken down to the most basic form, sugar, since sugar is the smallest one that can pass into the bloodstream. And then most of your digestible carbs are converted into glucose, since it's the universal energy source. Fibers, for the most part, can't be broken down, and so they basically leave the body undigested. If you think about corn, if you eat corn, corn's a really cool fiber, but it comes out as it goes in for the most part. So as you can see here, your carbs should be the greatest portion of your diet, somewhere between 55 to 60 percent. And we talked about the glycogen energy is related to the respiratory system. So you have two types, complex, and that's your starches, and that's what's found into your, your foods. Uh, it does ha also have some vitamins that you need. Remember, vitamins and minerals are your micronutrients. They also give us water, fiber, protein, all those other things that can help us to inhibit uh, disease. And here's some that you can see. You have some grapefruits and lemons and oranges and all those really good things. It's kind of a good time of the year because we have a lot of fruits that are coming out. And then, of course, there's tomato juice. And if you're not too keen on tomato juice, the celery is pretty good for you, too. Celebra celery contains a lot of fibers. And simple are your free sugars. There are found in fruits. Um, the unfortunate point, we see a lot of simple sugars in refined foods. These are your donuts, your cakes, and things like that. If you look at a box of, say, for brownie mix, I always do that every now and then, just to remind me why I'm not making brownies. The first uh, ingredient you see is sugar. So if you see sugar among the first five, if there's more than five um, ingredients, that might be something that you want to take a look at. The problem with sugars, they don't pay for anything they use, okay? You have to use a lot of energy to break them down. As a result of that, they're going to go ahead and spike your blood sugar. Um, they're going to make you feel good really quickly, uh, last for about 30 minutes or so, and then you start to fade. And so then you go grab another one, and that brings you up again, because you're really spiking your insulin at this particular point, okay? And they are rapidly absorbed from the intestinal tract. Problem is, like I said, they don't pay for themselves. They just use and use and use. So unfortunately, here you see this little cute bunny. If he's dark chocolate, is he good for you? And then you see all of these. Those are really kind of cool if you look at them, the different things that you have. I showed this one time and people go, I don't know what the problem is. You got eggs and everything else. And when their classmates said, yeah, but they're all candy. 
Okay, so when we think about candy, um, you know, is candy good for you? Is candy not good for you? Remember, they're telling you dark chocolate's really good. About an ounce and a half a day will help you with your blood sugar and your blood pressure. So one of the things we always talk about when we talk about teaching people, especially those with COPD, how to eat, we tell them to stay away from pastas and th different carbs and everything like that because we said it's going to increase your CO2 levels. Remember, carbs have one respiratory quotient, and that means you're producing as many much CO2 as for the oxygen you're using. However, we found out that not everybody gets that. In some cases, people actually get elevated PaO2 levels, and this can be between 7 and 9 millimeters of mercury. So you've got to be careful what you tell these folks, because sometimes it's not true for them. High-carb diets increase your endurance. It allows the work to be completed with less oxygen use. The major problem is when we give you glucose, this has a high RQ and a conversion to fat causing weaning difficulties. Remember I told you we used to not feed our patients extremely well, and when we didn't feed them, we would give them carbs, and then we wondered why they were working so hard to breathe, and then we were wondering why we didn't give them off ventilators. And so then we offset it with fats, which was much, much better, okay? Um, infused fat with glucose gives us energy, inhibits the fat synthesis pathway so, you don't, pathway, so you don't get the excessive CO2 production. And most individual diets and balance, diets balance fats and carbs for each patient, because there's not one rule that fits everybody. Fiber is kind of interesting. We are very bad about eating fiber. If you look at the bottom, you're going to see the recommended daily allowance is somewhere between 21 to 38 grams per day, depending on your age and gender. And most of the time, we don't eat fiber when we really, really need to. We find it in our fruits, our vegetables, our grains, soluble fiber, partially dissolved in water, insoluble can't. If you see the commercials on Quaker oats, if you're eating oatmeal, um, Oatmeal is really, really good because it's fiber and it actually moves uh, through the digestive system for you. Okay. The other thing that uh, fibers do for us, they help reduce the risk of heart disease, diabetes, diverticulitis, and then constipation. Proteins, and your book has got a few other things they've added to proteins, but for the most part, it makes up about 12 to 15 percent of your diet. And if you're a normal, healthy person, you only need 0 0.8 grams per kilo. Uh, for folks who are medically challenged or patients with COPD, the book is going to tell you it's like 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilo for those folks. And we can estimate through your nit nitrogen intake as to how much protein you're getting. Um, remember, all of your amino acids are made up of proteins. They all contain nitrogen, and that's the easiest way for us to go ahead and measure it. Now, I just thought he was so cute. I don't want to eat him. He's such a sweetheart. Anyways. How do we measure it? We can use your BUN or UUN, which is your urine, urea, nitrogen, in addition to your uh, bun. 100 grams of protein contains like 6.25 grams of nitrogen. You can then figure out all of this, and then you can find out what you have. Now, what you're looking for, for patients in the hospital, for the most part, we're looking for a positive nitrogen balance. We want them to have more nitrogen than they're excreting, or more nitrogen than when we're feeding them, okay, because sometimes we're not feeding them as well as we need to. Normal folks, we should have a balance, okay, what you take in should go out. If you're losing too much, then you're going to end up with a negative nitrogen balance, okay. Um, severely ill patients and those not getting enough are normally in this nitrogen negative balance. That means the body's protein is being used for energy, and this means the patient is much weaker. We have a lot of muscle wasting. Wasting occurring at that particular point in time. And there you go. This is your did you know chapter. If water was removed from the body, approximately 75% of the remaining weight is protein. You find it almost everywhere muscle, bone, skin, hair. We know all of that. Your nails. 
um, makes up the enzyme for chemical reactions and hemoglobin for carrying oxygen. And there's, we talked about the other day, there's at least 10,000 proteins in you who make you what you are and keep you that way. And this is one of the things that you can see from a lack of protein. Sometimes when they show some of the um, pictures on TV, you know, can we give money to um, help feed the underdeveloped, the children in the underdeveloped world, people see these pictures and they see that protruded abdomen and they think, well, these kids are eating. Um, fortunately, they're not, okay? And we have to realize that. Where do we see this? We see this in their hair, their skin. They have a lot of edema, fatty degeneration of the liver, anemia, apathy, um, basically a lot of problems with them. Too much protein, remember we talked a little bit about that, it makes you very sensitive to changes in your PaCO2. Um, you sometimes have a hyperventilation because your PaCO2 went up a little bit, even though you could be still in the normal range, okay? It has a stress on the liver and the kidneys. People who used to do the Atkins diet ate a lot of protein and they produced a lot of ketones and it was really, really bad on their kidneys. Uh, what they found out when they did a study was is that if you did a food modification for a year and you did the Atkins diet for a year, you'd lose the same amount of, of weight. So there's ways of doing that, okay? Uh, it has acid-base balance issues. Uh, it's the major source of your ingest and fixed acids. Uh, plant proteins are more alkalotic, okay? And they're to help buffer the protein acid. Without your protein, uh, plant proteins, calcium is pulled from the bones, and we're gonna use that calcium for your buffering at that particular point. And they actually did this study with some nurses, and it was a very long-term study with them, and that's how they found out about the cal calcium being pulled from the bones. More protein leads to about a 20% increase in risk fractures when compared to normal protein intakes. You can also see that increased work of breathing um, as far as that. And then, like I said, it does affect our acid-base balance. But not all proteins are equal. The body doesn't store proteins. We use the amino acids, but we're not going to store the proteins. So everything depends on the amount of the essential amino acids in your food. And these are not synthesized in sufficient quantity in the body or not at all, so you have to eat them. And so of the 22 amino acids, nine are essential. And then you can see the ones that are down on here. So the best way to to provide more calories to hospitalized patients, especially those on fluid restriction or unable to eat large quantity of foods, just think about fats, okay? Uh, we have a lot of fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. On occasions, I haven't seen them lately, you could sometimes get E as a water soluble. Most of the ones I've seen lately are back to fat soluble. Um, why do we worry about fats? It's part of your immune system, it's an antioxidant, and it also involves blood clotting. The other thing is they're very energy dense. They contain twice the number of calories per gram as carbs and proteins, okay? So you've got a, more energy in a smaller portion at that point. And the best storage form for energy, remember we store it as fat and adipose tissue. And these are some of your fats and oils, avocado, coconut. Coconut's the big thing in the, all the rage today. Um, is it good? Is it not good? Just depends on who you're talking to, unfortunately. Margarine, though, is going down the rabbit hole. People are suggesting that you use butter. Butter's supposed to be good for you and better for you. Something else that a diet and fat does for you. It provides that feeling of fullness, okay? It helps improve taste of food. Um, I know one time uh, we were talking and some of the students were talking about uh, the meals on wheels and that these foods were delivered and some of the folks got them and they wouldn't eat them because there was no flavor to them, okay? And so what we need to do is figure out how to make them more flavorful. 
The other thing you do is digest more slowly than the carbs or protein. So it's going to last a little bit longer. It's not going to spike your insulin. And there you can see two of your essential fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6s. These are good for the inflammatory process, nerve functions, some other chemical activities that you're going to see. Um, it's a component of all cell membranes. It gives us energy stores, organ protection. Um, you got to think about it, you know, if you are 600 pounds, which is unfortunate because you can't move and you're using a lot of energy. Um, you have a lot of organ protection, though, because if you somebody shoots you, they probably will hit fat rather than organs. So it's not a good reason to be fat, though, OK? And it is a major component of surfactant. Unfortunately, the typical diet is about 30% fat. That's way, way too much. So what we see, too much fat, increased heart risk uh, disease, risk of heart disease, increased risk of breast, colon, and lung cancer, decreased oxygen to the tissues, your repairs, your DLCO. Um, you have it decreased capillary circulating because of red blood cell clumping. But you produce less CO2 because the RQ is 0 0.7. So you're not quite dys dysmic, and you do have a little bit better with your breathing, OK? Uh, we don't necessarily see this on everybody. Uh, however, you really need, need to figure out how we're going to get the best ratio of carbs, proteins, and fats. <clears throat> so quantity versus quality, too much is not a, too bad and not too much is not too good. So the wrong type, though, is bad. Saturated fats have no double bonds. If, if you look at chemistry, if you all could took a organic chemistry or whatever, you know there's the bonds that show you how everything's put together. Saturated, there's no double bonds. Everything is filled, has something on it. Unsaturated has some double bonds. Polyunsaturated has more than two. And monounsaturated only has one double. And there's not necessarily think anything on it, so you have something that you can actually attach to it. So this is a comparison of dietary fats and oils. Flaxseed is at the top. Canola is another one that people are standing back on, and they're telling you the body doesn't know what canola oil is. Although it looks really good, it may not be really, really good. Uh, if you have diabetes, they tell you olive oil is really, really good. Uh, they tell you olive oil is really, really good, even if you don't have diabetes, because what it does is delaying, spiking the insulin. It slows the digestion of the food down at that particular point. So there's some of these that are really, really good. Some of the ones, um, lard, beef tallow, palm oil is something we're seeing a lot of now. I'm not hearing too much good about that one. Butter fat, so-so. And there's your coconut oil on the bottom. Like I said, some people will tell you coconut oil is good for your skin. Um, it's good for a lot of other things that you can take a look at. Uh, but to eat it, a lot of it is not necessarily the best thing you can do. So monounsaturated is our best to that particular point. This is your olives, nuts, and avocados. It does lower your total NLDL. Um, it regulates your blood sugar, blood pressure. There's your olive oil, your canola oil, like I said. Depends on who you talk to and who's reviewing it. Now, if you want to know if you have a good fat, take your um, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, divide it by saturated, and if it's greater than one, that's a good fat. So the other thing, trans fats, these, like I told you at one time, this is heating wonderful, wonderful, like olive oils, canola oils, whatever. Um, in the presence of hydrogen, it becomes hydro hydrogenated. These are going to last a long time. They raise your LDL. They decrease your HDL. They've been linked to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, other chronic conditions. You, there's sometimes that these exist in nature. If you're eating the food, you're going to have to eat it. But if you're going to buy food, look, because what you're going to look for is the partially hydrogenated, OK? And it will tell you partially hydrogenated, and they'll put it in parentheses behind it. And you have these wonderfully good oils that are now not wonderfully good. Vitamins, basically organic compounds, very small amount. You still need them for various metabolic pathways and body processes. 
Some of them are water soluble, the B group and vitamin C in some cases, fat solubles, there's your A, D, E, and K that you do the use for ward off scurvy and rickets. Uh, we think that they can prevent heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis. Interesting because there's a lot of debate going on about calcium supplements. There's also a major debate going on about D. Um, we know that a lot of folks are deficient in vitamin D and they're actually prescribed it, but they also are talking about the facts that if you take too much vitamin D, now you get some other issues that are coming into play here. So if you're taking the supplements, make sure you understand where your levels are and that, um, you know, avoid going overboard on these because they do have problems. Decreased vitamin intake may require supplementation. If you're not eating a lot of food, you're not getting the vitamins. Remember, some of these vitamins interact with medications. For people of age, if you give them some vitamins and minerals, they seem to stay a little bit healthier, okay? They go ahead and increase your antioxidants. They increase your plasma beta carotenes, which are always good because they, they help solve those free radicals. Uh, they increase your FEC levels. Um, smokers have decreased antioxidants with decreased lung function and greater mortality. If you hear decreased in C and E, you have wheezing. Remember vitamin A, your mucous membranes are going to work. Um, you're going to help promote resistance to respiratory tract infections. It is depleted in smokers, and they found out in rats it caused emphysema. I'm not sure how many cigarettes they had the rats smoke, but I'm sure the rats weren't terribly happy. Your carotene is your vitamin A precursor. Vitamin C is going to help you also. So vitamin E, C, and selenium, selenium is a pretty good one. These are all antioxidants and they loosen the effect of ototoxicity in ozone on lung tissue. And there you can find vitamin E in your corn, your nuts, your olives, green leafy vegetables. They tell you to eat phyto um, chemicals. These are your colored ones. You know, don't stick with basic green. Add some red and yellow and blue, whatever else happens to be out there. And then minerals, we didn't have the mineral show this year that I remember, and therefore we didn't get the rain. I was thinking about that the other day. But if you're also a micronutrient, okay, and sometimes also if you're not eating enough, we have to go ahead and supplement with minerals. So some of the nutrients, we have iron. Remember, iron is going to carry your oxygen for you. Remember, iron deficiency anemia is the number one cause of anemia in the world. Iron deficiency anemia, okay? Uh, there's your phytochemicals, colors and active components. Uh, they decrease uh, chronic diseases, including asthma, and you find them only in plants, okay? So they're in their fruits, your vegetables, and your berries. There's some pretty colored ones. The omegas 3 and 6, this is your flaxseed and fish oil, anti-inflammatory effects in the body. They are linked to chronic disease, skeletal muscle loss, and COPD if you don't have them. They do lead to airway inflammation and asthma. It leads to bronchoconstriction. You want to try to make sure that you have some of these. Dietary omega-3 or most of these are polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. Fluids, remember, you have to have fluids but you also have to make sure of two things, that you don't have too much because you're gonna go ahead and um, affect the amount of the uh, vitamins, minerals, whatever in your body. Doesn't mean that you're gonna have to add more. Remember, uh, we have to give you free water, back you off, and then we can get those more normal amounts. The other problem you have is if you're not drinking, remember people of age don't drink until they're really, really thirsty. Now they're building up and they're gonna cause problems with that. You gotta get some fluid on board. As you can see, your body is 60% fluid by weight. You need the fluid for your mucociliary clearance to work. The way you lose fluid is urine, feces, sweat, breathing, and exportation, okay? You have both sensible and unsensible loss. Some unsensible I can't measure, sensible I can. 
So which type? Water is probably the best. And when they tell you to drink water, they're telling you, no, don't drink ice water. Drink something that's like at room temperature. It's much, much better. Your body likes that. Uh, some of your fruit or vegetable juices, be careful with those. You have folks that tell you don't drink them. There's too much sugar in them. Even if you go ahead and squeeze your own, they'll sometimes tell you there's not enough pulp in them. Um, if you're going to drink them, I wouldn't drink a whole bottle of it a day, but you can take some and you can also dilute it with water a little bit and that seems to help. Remember, caffeine promotes strong dilation mm -hmm. and too much caffeine and theophylline cause you to do what? Mm, strange. Alcohol, though, is not necessarily what you want to be drinking. It decreases your FEC, FEV1. Um, it gives you proper constriction. It breaks your lung defense, and it increases the likelihood of sleep apnea. And remember, we see this in males around age 50 and above a little bit. IV or fluid overload can give you pulmonary congestion or edema. This increases the workload on the lungs. It increases the work on the heart. Uh, you have to watch your potassium, uh, sodium, and chloride levels because of your acid base balance. Uh, you have to watch and see the medications you're taking. What are they going to affect at that particular point? Okay. And basically, uh, with kids, we have to watch it. Kids will fluid overload a whole lot uh, more easily than adults do. So what are some of the nutritional problems we have? Uh, loss of appetite. You go in the hospital, you're not going to eat. Even at home, people say, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry. This meal when they're eating, especially if they eat too much at that particular point, um, because of problems with their mouth, okay, uh, or problems with swallowing. People have problems with swallowing because they'll sometimes react to different uh, chemicals within the food. Uh, fluid restrictions, we keep those on in the hospital a lot of times uh, because we don't want to overload these patients. And then your comatose patient or other patients you can't eat at all. So we need to think about what's going on with these patients. In the hospital, maybe sometimes we can get a little bit better handle on them. Unfortunately, for the patients outside the hospital, if they're not being followed up, we don't know, do they have a place to cook? Are they able to get to a store and buy food? Um, you know, do they know what they can eat that's good for them? Um, stay away from your things that are high and really saturated fats and things like that. So sometimes education is really, really important with these folks. So how do we want to feed you? Um, Intero is really good. Uh, this is preferred over anything else. Uh, you can feed through an NG tube, TPN. This is in fact, uh, infusion through the peripheral or central vein. Very inspect, uh, expensive, and it does increase the risk of infection, OK? So COPD, chronic bronchitis. Uh, remember, we see the flattened diaphragms. That's why they can't eat these big meals. We need to tell them, let's go to smaller meals. Try to get their energy up because if they're still unable to breathe well, they're not going to have the time to stand there and make a lot of small meals, okay? So we do have to be careful with that. A lot of times COPD patients or patients with COPD are underweight and they need a positive nitrogen balance. And if they could they increase their caloric intake, that'll help their muscle mass. Some of your patients with chronic bronchitis are overweight. They need a normal nitrogen balance and they need to decrease some of their caloric uh, intake. That would help them with their respiratory functions. So what is our role in all of this? We're a second set of eyes. We need to work with the nurse and the dietitian. As I told you, with the dietitian, if they're going to do a swallow study, we're there to help because we're going to be doing the suctioning. We're going to watch what the patient coughs out. Uh, and if they're coughing out any of the dye and the fluid and everything like that that has been given to them to eat, then we know that we need to contact the dietitian. Plus, we're going to tell the nurse and the physician at the same time. Uh, we can sometimes help with nutritional assessments. Uh, there's a lot of them that happened at this particular point. Uh, ladies, stay away from the one that goes around your arm. It doesn't work for us. It's terrible. 
Oh, you can do your ideal body weight. You can also do your BMI and things like that. So some of the lab tests, the creatine phosphate, this is your energy reserve, the creatinine height is predictive body mass, serum albumin. Remember, you've got to have serum albumin made in the liver. It's there to keep the fluid where it has to be. There's your oncotic osmotic pressure. Uh, Prealbumin is nutritional deprivation or refeeding. Um, you got to have serum transfer to balance tr and transfer the iron. You have to be able to see what's going on with this patient. And you have to look at everything that's going on with this patient, because if you're not, you may miss really what's happening with them. So there it is, dietary needs, aspiration. We're a lot of times after a patient has been extubated, we're sometimes the first one to see that they're aspirating. And so, you know, this is something we need to look at. We just don't extubate these patients and go off for a four-hour lunch. We need to come back and see how they're doing, keep an eye on them if we're starting to hear wheezing. And you can ask them, have, are you eating? What are you doing at this particular point? Especially if they didn't have wheezing before, okay? So just be aware of that. Uh, Cachetic, nutritionally depleted. These guys are really, really uh, bony. And you can see depression in the intercostal space is a lot of um, accessory muscle use and severe muscle wasting. Obesity, restrictive component. Pregnancy, unfortunately, can do the same thing because it sits on the diaphragm and pushes it up a little bit. Um, you can see the velocity of the sputum increasing, um, all those different things that go on with it. Oscillation, remember, if you're on a starvation diet, you're going to have um, lots of surfactants. You're going to hear a lot of wheezing going on. Uh, there's food colors or alcohol or aspirated food can cause wheezing. Uh, the fine late inspiratory crackles or, or malnutrition or pulmonary edema. Remember, S3 is your CHF. S4, severe anemia. Okay, so you got to be aware of that. And then, you know, look for malnutrition. Um, and what are they eating? You know, don't be afraid to ask somebody, hey, how are you doing? What's your diet at home? Hopefully, they'll be able to talk with you, especially if you establish a good relationship with them. ABGs, we'll see an increase in the PaCO2 if we give you a lot of parental infusion of glucose or an adequate muscle strength. We'll see that. PaO2, anemia with iron deficiency. Um, your high fat or lipids may affect your patient also. Alter pH, the same thing. Look at the foods and see what's going on with these patients.